Let's drink some coffee Let's pump some iron Let's start a company It's Coffee Moguls It's Coffee Moguls Welcome to Coffee Moguls, a new podcast about technology and entrepreneurship. I'm Nathan LeClaire and I'll be your host. I worked at startups such as Docker and Honeycomb. I'm an engineer and I know lots of code in and out, but I'm fascinated as well by the world of business. In Coffee Moguls, we'll be diving into the stories told by famous people in the industry, how they got to where they are, and what tips they would give to people who are just starting out. Welcome everyone to another episode of Coffee Moguls, and today I'm very excited to have on the phone James Turnbull. So James, I have known actually for many years, and James was the one that hired me into Docker, and he's been stuck with me ever since. I wouldn't have said stuck, and I, and I think uh, it was my it was well to my advantage to fire you into Docker. There was definitely some things that I didn't want to do that you did much better than I did. I think that's that's the best possible outcome in an early stage startup when you're hiring somebody. That is one way to get your foot in the door is to uh, do the things that uh, the other people don't want to do. <laughs> And uh, yeah, we could talk a little bit about maybe what some of those things were, but yeah, why don't you just tell us a little bit about your background, how you evolved into the form you are today and what your history is. I've been an engineer for about 25 years, I think, which explains why I have no hair and, and I'm mostly gray. I spent the first part of my career largely doing enterprise sort of things, banking finance principally, and I transitioned into sort of engineering leadership roles and sort of some stints as ICs in the middle there. About 10 or 12 years ago, I started working probably predominantly in startups uh, or at least startups adjacent. I was an early employee at Puppet who made the Puppet Configuration Management Tool. I was an early employee at Docker. That was where obviously where I know you from. I worked at Venmo, I was a CTO at Kickstarter. I've done some work at Microsoft running their CTO in residence program and their startup advocacy outreach program. I've been a founder and an investor and a startup advisor. And these days I'm uh, working at Sotheby's, helping them with digital transformation and growing and building a product and engineering team. Nice. Yeah. And at Sotheby's, that's pretty fun. I don't know with the Corona, are, are like art galleries and that kind of thing, are they back open? I think they are in certain places. I think the, the big thing for Sotheby's was, strangely enough, when the pandemic happened, you could no longer get large groups of people into a room to bid on things. The in-person auctions were not something that could operate. And so uh, Sotheby's was obviously already a fairly online sort of organization. We have a pretty sophisticated auctions marketplace tool that's built in Scala and Go Microservices running on AWS. What we essentially had to do was migrate the sort of physical aspect of an auction into a digital sort of space and then and then execute on that. And we're pretty well set up to do that, but it does obviously when you have a I guess what's fairly short notice that you're suddenly not going to be physically doing things in person and you need to you know, stream things and, and organize things and, and handle things particularly when you deal with physical objects obviously a piece of art or watches or jewelry or wine it's a reasonably complicated process in a pandemic world oh yeah tell me a little bit more about that what makes it complicated and I'm assuming that this was something they were probably not prepared for at all I don't Where think anyone was prepared for this. But, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, but like, I don't know if there existed like Sotheby's online auction before and then they just had yeah, to ramp that yeah. up. Uh, so, oh, okay, yeah. Uh, online auctions existed beforehand, so it was a matter of ramping that up. But uh, I think when you think about an organization like Sotheby's, I think they always assumed that physical auctions would take place, or at least for some the foreseeable future. I, I think there's a certain theater in, in physical auctions, and I think... If you've ever been to a house auction or to a, even to a government disposable auction or, a, or some, an auction at a state fair when they're selling a prize ram or something like that, it, it's, it's a theater. It's an entertaining theater. And so I don't think the organization had ever foreseen a situation where they would suddenly have to drop physical events in favor of purely digital ones. But ultimately, in addition to that, Sotheby's is a supply chain business, right? Like we, we, we sell objects. We obviously don't sell perhaps at the scale at, at, that Amazon does, but at a probably significantly different values. Amazon obviously has to ship your goods across the country. And if you're an Amazon Prime member, they, they do it for whatever you don't pay for that shipping. We, we the difference is we might be trying to ship a hundred million dollar painting across the world post an auction, which has, you know, a similar, it's a similar supply chain, but a different set of constraints and problems. So the, there is a requirement for the organization to still be a physical presence. Like we can't, like the organization can't be fully remote and there, there are things that can't be done. So we obviously have to take appropriate precautions to ensure that employees were 
safe and wealthy and healthy and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And I got to imagine that the target market or the people that are buying these things is very different, obviously, than people just buying commodities in a way on Amazon, where they probably are really picky and want to see a lot of photos and th that's the sort of thing. Yeah, and, and there's, there's, a, there's a spectrum of folks. Obviously, we have a marketplace as well. So we have we also play in the space of, of selling things like sneakers and watches and things that, at the, the lower end of the price point. But obviously, one of the important things about an organization like Sotheby's is that the brand is very strong about authenticity and provenance, right? So the people who buy our objects, uh, we're making a commitment to them that the thing we're selling to them is the genuine article and that you can trace the history to it and all that sort of stuff. And that's really important to us. That's a, that's a core value for our organization is that sort of level of trust. And we obviously need to ensure that customers um, feel comfortable about that in a, a purely digital environment. Yeah, exactly. I got to imagine that just ratchets that sort of anxiety about getting a fake or getting something that is not what you had in mind that much more because you're not physically there. I'm probably not the best person to answer that, that question. I'm not, I'm, I'm not on the sort of art side of things, but uh, yeah, all, all I can say is that, that obviously that, that commitment is something that, that the organization takes very seriously. Yeah, yeah, totally. So what is your favorite thing that you've seen for sale so far? I'm still, this is going to sound, make me sound really old, but I'm still bemused by sneakers. I'm anyone who knows me knows I'm obviously a, a deep, deeply interested in fashion. I owned this, I owned the same set of black band t-shirts I owned when I was 20 and the same cut of, of jeans that I, I, I wore when I was 20, so maybe slightly larger sizes. And I'm not someone who buys a lot of pairs of shoes and stuff like that. I think I've owned the same pair of Blundstones for, for five years. So yeah, the idea that people tend to spend a lot of money in sneakers, I think it's, I think it's, I, I, I understand because I, I do collect things. I like, you know, I understand the instinct of collectors, but sneakers is, is something that I never would have thought about as a collectible. It's super cool. And I'm learning a heap about, about well, what people do and why they do it and what's, what's valuable in that sort of space. But I'm still like, there's still to me, it's like, it's shoes, which I guess is deeply any, anybody who is in the fashion industry is probably laughing the house off because there's the like handbags and shoes and coats and things like go for enormous amounts of money why wouldn't sneakers no so it's like, it just to me is like wait what but yeah it is um there's, there's some cool stuff there i, get, I guess i get some like uh, you know i collect wine so i'm like I'm, I'm not particularly shocked by it by people buying wine but yeah sneakers was a new one wine is consumable and has so much clout and history behind it and sneakers i'm just like what you mentioned where i've worn the same clothes for 10 years and sneakers connect with the ground so <laughs> i guess that, like the like the uh, a limited edition kobe bryant pair of nike sneakers or, or whatever happen, happens to be like that's a that has a clout and a collectible and a cult it has cultural value to somebody uh, in the same way that that yeah a premier crew Bordeaux from a particular a good vintage and a good house is, has has a similar sort of cultural clout to someone who cares about wine it was just yeah it took me back because I, I was like i'd put that together as a construct yeah, maybe someday, like a hundred years in the future, they're gonna be the equivalent of like sommeliers for sneakers or like for hype beasts. So they'll have these like vintage Supreme shirts and stuff that you can wear. I've got to say, if, if any business survives a hundred years and an apocalypse, it might be Supreme. So. <laughs> <laughs> Some brands just have that staying power. That's very. They're very good at what they do. We're all just roaming around like Mad Max style, and we've got our kind of janky cars and guns and stuff and we're all just wearing supreme t-shirts i can I get to see it like yeah, i'm central park and i'm hunting my irradiated squirrels after the apocalypse and then standing in line from my supreme uh you know object yeah you get your like supreme ration with little uh, pellets of food and water so that's fun stuff that's really fun and you also do some other things so one of the things i wanted to talk to you a lot about because i know you've been really active in it for many years and have actually helped me to do some things in this area too is your independent writing how did you get started like how did james the author become a thing i've always written things stuff and I, obviously I, I read a lot and i grew up in a household where uh, my dad's an author and, and has written a couple of books and my sister is a is an artist and, and is uh, published and so it's not it wasn't i guess tremendously unusual but somebody about 15 years ago a bit more than that a press approached me about uh, a book i'm not quite sure how it came about how they got introduced to them but they're interested in a book about Linux security and that there was obviously a, a sort of resurgence of interest in security around the Linux space and uh, I decided that I decided I might well take a stab at it and I wrote a couple of chapters and they were like this is pretty good and do you want to want, do you want to write the book and I was like okay um and uh uh after that you know that they kept 
kept proposing. I, I, either I or they kept proposing topics, and, and I wrote a few more books. And eventually, though, I decided that working with a the publisher, there's some really great. There were some really great people at A Press. I, I met some dear friends, and uh, uh, I know some wonderful people from the industry there. But the world moved, and uh, one of the ways it moved is that the self-publishing became a, a much more practical exercise, both from a sort of technological logistics point of view. But also from a marketing point of view and, and the value necessarily in, in marketing a book through a publisher wasn't there. If it's a purely, I only, I only do ebooks, I don't write any, don't write any physical books anymore. So I don't need a supply chain. I don't need to get them on the shelves of bookstores or physically into warehouses at Amazon and lots of the stuff. So and I don't have to worry about print. So to me, a lot of the value in, in having a publisher was not was no longer there. And yeah, so I, I moved into purely writing self-published sort of things. And also, in fairness, you say the royalties uh, and the costs are somewhat more attractive in a self-published world too. Obviously, I'm paying the the, the cost of publishing the book, or and, and all of the infrastructure and all of the sort of uh, editors and, and copywriters and stuff, copy editors and stuff like that. But everything beyond that is in my pocket versus sharing that with the publisher. Of course, yeah, exactly. And I, I almost feel like in a lot of different markets or industries you are seeing a bit of that decoupling where you did have to have that sort of strong company that you ally yourself with so that they can take advantage of these like economies of scale and then the internet just shakes it all up yeah i guess the i, I don't know what the value of the self-published book market is fiction or non-fiction but i imagine it's pretty large these days and for a lot of people it's obviously they're going the opposite direction that they really are they're self-publishing stuff with a view to a publisher picking it up and there are a number of very well known authors who whose initial works were self-published and are attracted to the publishing interests certainly in the fiction space and the genre fiction space particularly like the there's still a there's still definite benefits in having a publisher and and being able to have someone take care of like being on the New York Times bestseller list and lots of the stuff. But, and, and not yeah. everyone wants to do all their own marketing yeah. and editing and that kind of thing. Yeah, and definitely there's a you know, there's definitely labor involved there that, that can be taken off your hands. But yes, overall, I think there there are a bunch of the marketplace as it were. If you think about the marketplace as a construct or the market has been. The traditional publishing market has been disrupted and, and it's not just there. It's you take all sorts of content, YouTube and, and video content and people, you know, I worked at Kickstarter. So there's obviously a huge sort of independently published games and books and music and create physical objects and you know, things like Oculus Rift were a Kickstarter originally. Like there's definitely a, a disruption of the sort of middlemen in the supply chain process and in the, in the sort of object sort of creation process. Totally. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So as you've gone through starting to self-publish and doing some books, like about about how many books have you self-published now? Self-published six, maybe seven? Six or seven books, right? Yeah. yeah. So as you've gone along the way, I got to imagine you really refined the process and started to learn some do's and don'ts. So what would you say you've learned along the way? Definitely, uh, there are some things that, that people aren't, that, that authors are not good at. And I, I would definitely say if you're self-publishing, you should employ an editor and a copy editor or, or one and the same edit. The value you get from having somebody else read your work and go, that doesn't make sense. Or this is what, this, what are you trying to say here? As well as fix the inevitable grammatical and issues and things like that i think that's something that i worked out fairly quickly after that. some not great so not some looking at some reading back some stuff and going wow obviously i missed a bunch of stuff in here that i should have fixed and the other is i think was the don't print books mostly because most of the topics i'm writing about are technology topics and they move really quickly i try and keep vague up to date but i, I generally try and i stop after a certain you know maybe a certain number of time, I think I don't update my Docker book anymore, for example. It's just too much to change in that world. And so it's valid up until a couple of releases ago, but stopped. And if people had copies of the, the first book printed, then I'm pretty comfortable in saying that would not be a, a viable reference. And I, I feel bad about someone buying something on paper that, that has, has such a limited lifespan. Indexing matters is a little thing. I, I, learning how to create an index and, and, and index the right words and all this stuff. Indexes are pretty valuable. It's something I hadn't really thought about before and something that normally a publisher takes care of for you yeah yeah how about like um, marketing yeah. what have you learned about what's the most effective way to frankly sell as many copies as possible i'm not 100 percent sure that i think being on amazon helps like i do think that uh, a lot of people go to amazon to look for things and, and having the right categorization being in the right places and obviously there's obviously ibooks and the google play store and 
Uh, there was things like Nook and stuff like that, but Amazon I think is probably the primary place where and having your own uh, having your own landing page and your own sort of place where people can buy the book. There's a lot of people. I get a lot of texts from people or emails from people and DMs from people saying, "What's the place I can buy your book where you get the maximum amount of return?" And and that's obviously if you buy it from me personally rather than buy it from me. Amazon obviously maximizes the amount of money I get back. So yeah, having that sort of landing page, understanding what a really clear call to action is like. This is this book is about X. You will learn Y. And, and at the end of it, you will be Zed. It's, to most marketing people, it's marketing 101. To a lot of engineers, it's not, it's not a natural way of thinking about the world. And beyond that, I think you have to be lucky and have timing. Like my Docker book sold really well because I think I, at the time, I was the only book written about Docker. And that was obviously well-timed. And for the first sort of six to 12 months of Docker's initial growth, there weren't very many alternatives out there. Yeah. 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 Or in... Yeah, you could call Docker themselves, which was also just me and you, essentially. And yeah, I think, uh, was, I guess, was, yeah, I guess Fred and you and me and like the, the Docker documentation team was not expansive. Aaron, I guess. there wasn't a lot of folks in that group. And I think uh, the first couple of cuts of the Docker documentation, pretty much you and I, maybe, I don't know. There, was a, there wasn't much in the education materials. Uh, and Sven, sorry, I apologize yeah. for Sven. I didn't, we didn't deli- forget you deliberately, Sven, just because we don't care. If it's, if Sven is Australian, he will appreciate <laughs> I want Sven to come on the podcast too. Like I, I need to, I'm going to have to probably chase him down, but I almost feel like I need Sven to come on and be part of some of these other segments I'm trying to do, like the hacker huddle where I'm diving through source code and stuff. But anyway, that's a digression. Sven is really great at that. He's really good at, he, he's very good at explaining things. He's really good at teaching stuff. I actually think Sven has a really good way with people and getting them to understand things. So our, our initial education stuff was, and that was, uh, I guess, Jerome and a few other folks as well. But uh, like that, I, I remember we, we were finishing the, the, the first Docker Conf, we were finishing the uh, education stuff and getting them printed at the printer the night before the conference, and we literally arrived with a the the, st- the paper still hot from the printers for the first training session. Yeah, that was a bit that was a little bit crazy. I remember that at yeah, DockerCon one, that was mm. wild. And actually, it's pretty funny. I think I remember when I joined, you told me I expect you to be at DockerCon, and I was just sort of, of course I will be. That is like. Fifty percent of the reason I'm joining right this second is so I can go. Yeah, those tickets were. I remember the, they were a pretty, a pretty in demand item at the time. I remember the Mark Paul marketing team were like, "We're never going to sell all these tickets," and I'm like, "Yes, we are. We're going to sell a lot more than these tickets," and and we indeed did. Yeah, so, yeah. Sven yeah. is really great, and he's just a smart person, super practical. And I just don't know how someone can have been in the technology landscape for as long as he has and just still have such a cherubic appearance. Yeah, and cheerful, like uh, remarkably well-adjusted. Yeah. Exactly. So I hope to get him on the pod uh, eventually. And, and that's uh, that's fun to uh, learn a little bit about your journey with self-publishing there. That's inspired me. I know I'd like to do more books. Kind of did one and just we're talking about the kind of marketing or segmentation aspect wasn't ideal so i'm gonna have to go back to the drawing board but moving on to a couple other topics we were talking a little bit about how you've been helping some folks out with just their engineering leadership and engineering management so uh, i was curious to hear from you what kind of problems do you see people run into really commonly and how could a, a theoretical company plan and try to avoid those problems cropping up in the first place i think the most common problem i see is is scale like whether it be both at the sort of customer engineering technical end and at the people end there's most of the people i talk to are startups and i'm giving advice to folks who are maybe fairly early stage seed series a and they range from zero to 50 engineers and they want to get they want to get to that next level of growth and for a lot of people, this is the first time they've had they're a founding CTO or a founder or the first engineering hire, and some of them have experience, but some of them this may be the first time they've been in a leadership role. And there are a lot of traps that you could fall into in there. But I think the key one is that I would say it's probably communication and collaboration. Things work really well when you're like for two zero to five engineers, say like maybe all in the same around the same table at a WeWork or at least in the last few years, like remote on a Zoom call like this. If your stand-up is five people and you know exactly who's doing what and where they're up to and what's happening, if that five people turns into 15 and say that's three teams instead of one, all of a sudden you start to, to uh, have communications challenges and collaboration challenges and those those fan out and, and start to appear in things like process breakdowns, like the what worked for CICD 
or what works for tests or what worked for QA at five engineers doesn't work at 15 and definitely doesn't work at 50. And every other process you can imagine has a, a is sort of touched by that, like hiring, like your idea. It's really easy when all of you have talked to, get to talk to everyone you, you hire because there are a small pool of you. But if all of a sudden there are 50 people in the company, a certain number of people will not meet that candidate. And then how do you ensure that, that you have a fair and diverse and, and an equitable hiring process that ensures you end up with the right people with the right skills? You need to start actually thinking about, we need to write something down and we need to have a process that works for more than just you know, this small number of people. And to ensure that people fit in with the culture and with the values of the company, not in the sense of we're a bunch of tech bros, so we're going to just hire other tech bros and call that fitting in with the culture, but in the sense of every company does have different values, sometimes wildly different values. And I do think a lot of friction can come out of different departments hiring people, maybe not conforming to the values of the company. Then you end up with all these people going in all these different directions. Is that something that- A little bit. I think the, I think I look at it in terms of when you think about those first few employees of a company, they have a real mission, right? And they're probably deeply invested in the company's success. So like the first couple of engineering hires are, are probably people close to the founders or people that, that, and people who've really bought into the mission. I don't think it's a certain scale and it's not that big. I don't think maybe it's in some cases it might be 50 or a hundred people. You get people who, who, yeah, they, they like your product. They think it's cool. They want to work on it, but this is their job, right? They're not as deeply invested in, in the organization. And honestly, there's, that's not necessarily a bad thing. And um, they probably don't have but, nearly as much equity or sort of skin in the game in that way. Yeah. And yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. So it, it's a matter of striking a balance between if you immediately disregard everybody who isn't cult like belief in the, in the success of the product, then that's a problem. If you then also hire people who, for whom this, the, don't have any sort of investment in the organization. I don't know. It's hard. It's a hard balance to strike. And I think that as we start to think more about things like burnout and work-life balance and stuff like that, you you have to acknowledge that your employer is not necessarily your friend. In fact, in many cases, it's not at all. And the you should have alignment with the organization you work for. You should hopefully care about their product and want to work on it and want to make it successful because you'd be successful. But ultimately, if you wrap your whole life up in, in that, then it's not necessarily a great place to be. Yeah, yeah, I definitely have had several exper experiences along that spectrum. And it's one of the things that's always bugged me is when companies say, we're the such and such family, right? Like you just said, the employer is not even your friend, much less your family. And then yet companies promote this. I can see where they're coming from. Uh, I always thought Honeycomb struck a pretty good balance in that way because they always said we're more than just a company, but we're definitely not a family. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've got to say, I, I, I think there's a lot of dysfunctional families out True. there, but there's certainly a lot of companies that are very dysfunctional. So, yeah, I'm. If someone says, "Oh, we're like a family," that is a, actually a red flag to me. I'm like, okay, I feel like this is probably on an un, 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 unhealthy level of engagement with the people that pay your salary. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I confess that that's a tri that's a set of trigger words for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm kind of curious, like speaking of equity and that balance there, we've seen a lot of companies. Obviously, there's been controversy over the no politics at work thing, which I'm I'm pretty sure I probably know how you feel about that. Uh, you're welcome to talk about it if you want. But what I'm more specifically curious about is this move that I've seen in a couple places to have RSUs that vest like once per year or something like that so that you just get this static amount of money every year instead of shares. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts on that? I don't know that I have strong feelings either. I think what the challenge is that if you join a, a very early stage startup, obviously the level of risk is really high, right? Like the, the I think more than 75, 80% of them don't make it to five years. There's some ridiculous percentage of failed startups. Yeah. And the expectation is that you take a lower salary and you get more equity. I'm very skeptical of that as an outcome. I think that if you can't, you need at least a living wage and you need something to live comfortably on. But yeah, you are, you, and you are taking a risk. And I think the, the difference is, is the different sort of models of, of this of RSUs and how, how you distribute this out and how you pay out things, I think probably vary on the evolution and age of the company. Like at certain points, if you are not one of the first 50 employees, there's probably not a 
like you might do okay out of an exit, but but maybe not awesomely. So if there's another way of like compensating later stage employees or a way to strike a balance, I, I'm I'm interested in looking at those. I'm not convinced that paying out paying out I guess you call it it's more like a retention payment rather or a bonus rather than necessarily a, a, a stock option sort of thing. I guess that 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 could have a benefits. I, I've worked for public companies and I, I do obviously there is a certain level of risk in you get RSUs and if you're lucky like I worked at Microsoft like Microsoft stock's pretty strong like it tends to fluctuate a little bit but it's pretty strong. But there are definitely other places I've worked at where the stock fluctuated violently and you could be worth a lot more than you were a lot less than you were one day than you were the previous so yeah having fixed amounts of money maybe that's a maybe that's a maybe that's a stronger way of doing that or a better guarantee depending how it's calculated yeah yeah yep. coinbase in particular i mean my gut reaction to this news that they were going to start doing it that way was that's terrible and I, I don't think it's great because I do think one of the advantages of going to a smaller company would be to have a shot at that upside, which you're not going to get. You're never going to get fantastically wealthy like a, a Tesla person that joined in 2014 or something. But especially for them, the stock's going to be extremely volatile. That thing could be 25% of its value in a year. Yeah, I definitely see that other side of the coin too. Yeah, honestly, things that come out of Coinbase, you alluded to the politics of work thing. I think that's, I think that policy is bullshit. The, we, we're part of the world. You can't interact like that. You can't imagine the thing that we spend most of our time doing is being at work and to, to ignore the fact that there are political connotations to that. The third wave feminist and personal is political. Like this is like saying, you know, a classic sort of turn of the century unionists, you know, turn of the 19th century unionists who are thinking about things like eight hour work days and no child labor and stuff like that would be like, oh, don't yeah, bring don't that bring politics, politics to work. To yeah. <laughs> That's just, or, or slavery or all sorts of issues where if it wasn't for the action of individual workers taking collective, either collective or individual responsibility and, and taking a stand, we would still be in a position where lots of horrific things would happen. Workers' compensation, health insurance, 40 hour work week, like those things are all things that came out of workers collectively taking action to protect themselves and, and others. And to say that is that action shouldn't be taken in a modern organization or should be push to the side is to me is authoritarian bullshit. Yeah. Yeah. I'm inclined to agree strongly. It's just, there's no separating people. You get people, you get politics. And so I think as some people online have pointed out, it's really just saying, Hey, we don't want to be bothered by that anymore. We don't want people to be bringing that to work because it's a pain in management's butt. Well, and you notice the commonality of the people that are saying that are people who look like me. They're, they're, they're white dudes who have an enormous amount of privilege, right? Can get away with it because it doesn't affect them. Like it, they're, they're looking to remove an annoyance in their lives, not, as you said, not to, not something that is, is endemic or systemic to their existence as it is for members of, of, of minority communities and people of color. Exactly. I really think that as a white guy, <laughs> as a white man, it's really easy to just not see that kind of stuff to have no visibility into it because like you said it doesn't affect you and so just like there's a natural human bias to look at unfortunate things that happen to other people and say that was because of them not being skilled enough or that's their own fault and then when unfortunate things happen to me that's because of bad luck or bad bad hands so i think that really plays into it that white men really don't look around a lot of the time and realize how bad it really is out there. Yeah, John, the, the science fiction author John Scalzi calls it playing on easy mode, like the like you, you the difficulty in a video game and, and being like white and middle class and college educated and speaking English as a first language and living in a first world country is like easy mode compared to folks who, who have different lives. Yeah, and it's like oxygen. You don't really notice it when everything's going and then I definitely know in my past that there were experiences that happened that really opened my eyes to things where I had no idea before. I was just completely clueless. Uh, oftentimes, it's sometimes it's embarrassing how clueless I was and still learning every day. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. So the, there's a couple other things I wanted to talk about. And one I was curious to learn what you're thinking about is... When we were working for Docker, that was just this red-hot supernova of action shaking things up in the industry. 
what do you see out there today that's shaking stuff up in, in DevOps in particular, and what's got you excited? Yeah, I actually had an analyst say to me the other day that, that I'd gotten things right a couple of times, therefore that was made me statistically more likely to the better person to ask the question of than I picked configuration management pretty early and I picked containerization pretty early and I had a, had a view that monitoring was going to be a market pretty early. I, I think some of that was to clear the luck and you know, obviously being at the coalface and seeing things that I think I'm probably less at the coalface these days and probably aren't as close to some of these things. One of the things I do see is fragmentation. So we have a lot of companies and products and, and tools, open source and proprietary both that do a lot of different things and we have a lot of startups that i would say are building things that i would probably describe as features rather than products so like they're, they're very point solutions that solve particular problems and so I, I look around and say there's definitely an opportunity for more gluey things out there if you think about uh classic example being like the layer of abstraction moving up the stack so you know, obviously configuration management abstracted away, like the ability to have to know user management command, commands and Docker abstracted away the, the, the need to care about disk memory and CPU, like at that sort of like physical hardware or virtual hardware sort of layer. And then Kubernetes abstracts away the management of those containers and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, up the food chain. At the moment, I think that there are a lot of point solutions, a lot of tools at that call face level, Cube included, monitoring solutions uh, as well, integrations with alerting tools and incident management tools and knowledge bases and all sorts of things that that sort of are out there that still require organizations to wire them together to gain the fullest benefit out of them. So I do think there's a market there for somewhere for, I, I would say it's some sort of brain in the middle or some sort of glue in the middle. Like, uh, I don't know what it is yet. It's, I'm still the solidify my thinking around it, but I described in a conversation with some people the other day, we were asking, we were talking about a product and I said that too many times I see business logic embedded into tools at the coalface. So your alerting system contains a whole business logic structure about what to do in the event of certain incidents and certain uh, certain problems. And every time you need to change that logic, which often, quite often happens in a startup, you need to go out to all of these tools and say, update this and this, versus having a central point where you say, okay, I care about this SLO with these SLIs and I want to, I want these people talk about the problem and I want to be able to add a new thing over here. I want that to inherit this. And I, I think the, I think that is something that, that interests me currently. I haven't yet, I guess, I said solidified thinking about what exactly that product looks like. Yeah, a lot of the things that you're saying there remind me of stuff we would run into in the field with customers at Honeycomb, where one is certainly a ton of fragmentation. Lots of people end up evolving to a place where they have 10 different tools and no one wants that. No one wants to be popping across 10 different web apps and learning and training on each one. And same thing with defining SLIs or something like that. That's still a unsolved problem. Being able to import that business logic in a nice smooth way into whatever systems you're using. Yeah, and, and also translating the business logic into, so like the business generally knows what they, I won't say what they want, but the, the general, general business generally understands what you know, what my good business looks like, whether it's MBS scores or the website is up during Friday or the, they generally understand that. They have a pretty good idea from a business point of view what sales should look like and maybe ASP and maybe some marketing things and stuff like that. But sometimes translating that the strategic uh, objectives of the organization or the business objectives into what does that look like at, at all the way down the technology stack is a lot harder like you can tag sort of things and say if this thing doesn't work and this thing doesn't work and the site's not available that's a problem but what is what constitute what con constitutes and maybe you can look at what constitutes good latency at a certain level or a customer experience but like how does that translate to individual components and how does that how does that how do we think about applications that are maybe distributed or maybe hard to reason about from that sort of end-to-end -end business perspective. So I, I think there's a, something in there, but I, I'm not quite sure. Some sort of technology business brain translation tool that wires together all of these things and ensures that they know what the, the current state of the world should be and, and how that relates to the performance of the business. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And even on the analytics side of the house, one thing that I found really difficult, even with a, a company full of pretty talented people and pretty uh, smart data people that know how to reason about data and analyze it and that kind of thing was that translating the analytics piece or just this giant sink of data that we have about user behavior into actionable things that we could go do 
was still a huge challenge. So yeah, I'm excited to see new things in that area. Yeah, tracing is a super interesting space here. Like the the it exposes an enormous amount of information about about what's happening in in, in an application's life. But it still requires. Like I was talking to Ben Siegelman the other day, and the, to me, it still requires reasonably savvy engineers. And I think Honeycomb is an amazing product, but it requires a lot of smarts to get it up and running and requires a lot of smarts to interpret the data. And until we are in a position where we can take advantage of that insight and not necessarily be like a, an engineer with 10 years experience or a backend engineer who deeply understands how things are wired together, we're, we're probably not, we're probably a ways off those tools becoming retail in the same way something like Datadog is. Yeah, and that's why I think Datadog's sort of the thousand pound gorilla in the room is because all those trends you know, converging into one tool, for instance, usability, appeal for retail market, as you put it, they start to hit that vertical really well. And so I think everyone's pretty nervous about them right now. And, and I know I was when I was at Honeycomb. <laughs> Yeah, the interesting thing, the interesting thing Datadog's got to got to worry about is, is uh, they've done, made a couple. I, I was obviously full disclosure. I was at Timber, which made Vector, who were bought by Datadog, and I have zero. I have zero idea what Datadog roadmap looks like. I'm not in. I have no privy insight to, to their plans. But they've bought you know several security companies, and they bought a security company. They bought Timber. They bought the uh, Logmatic folks a while back, and then that became Datadog Logs. They have a lot of tools that they're integrating into the environment and that adds inherent complexity. One of the advantages of Datadog, it was really easy to onboard and was really easy to get a, a, a sort of a view of your, like, I'm an Amazon user, I get to automatically get all these graphs and I get to import all of this stuff and all this data and I can see what's happening. And that was one of the, the appeals of Datadog. If you add some really complex constructs, right, both in terms of data structures, like tracing and stuff like that, which is if you imagine the 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 data construct for a, for a metric is significantly less complex than a data construct for a, for a trace. Like, how easy is that to present a an amazing user experience that's easy for people to consume? How do you have the potential to lose that ease of use that made them so appealing? And I imagine that's a, probably something they're thinking about a lot. Totally, and unifying those gaps between these various solutions that weren't necessarily thought or designed to work together from day one, I think will be a big challenge for companies like that going forward, especially because the kind of core or mothership always wants to protect what they have. That, that legacy business, for lack of a better way of putting it, always i think we'll have a bit of hesitancy to integrate with the new things and so it really takes some talented leadership to suss that out and make the transition well yeah i think cor correlation is, is still a big problem metrics logs traces we, we talk about those as being the sort of tiers or pillars of, of observability data yet it is really hard to actually correlate you know, take an incident and then work out which bunch of logs which bunch of metrics which bunch of traces are relevant to that and, and to bring in adjacent things and, and do analysis and, and diagnosis and attempt to determine like attempt to determine what, what's happened in order to understand like how to fix it. I, I think those are non-trivial problems still. Like you get a lot, we get a lot of data now that we didn't previously and it's much easier to see, but with that comes the, the analysis problem. Yeah. And I don't think anyone solved that yet. Yeah, totally. Plus I just think there's a natural gap between what most engineers are used to doing in development and how they get information there and fix problems locally. And then that more operational mindset that people have to start thinking about, how do I shape this as a metric or a log that's practical to search on or a trace? A tracing instrumentation is something that's just starting to become a little more mainstream. People are starting to adapt to that idea. They're still holding on, I think, to the hope that we can just do it without changing code. Yeah, that's a funny one. That's another reason why that this sort of is a problem for you need a certain amount of engineering experience to be able to instrument an app that is uninstrumented. And honestly, I, I'm glad things like open tracing and open telemetry have headed in the same. There is a something resembling a standard appearing, but as yet those are pretty immature. And I, I've played around with most of the SDKs and the and the sort of and I'm like this doesn't really meet. The, it, like it, it, it gets me some of the way there and it's like utility methods and helps me out along the way, but it definitely doesn't solve the fact that I still need a fairly deep understanding of how my application is wired together in order to work out the right points to instrument. And until we do something about that, and I, you know, whichever vendor works out how to do that is, is going to make a lot of money. Yeah, yeah. And you still have to understand propagation and all this other stuff. And it's just very much a, you really got to open the hood to the car and wrench around 
ideally you wouldn't have to. Yeah, yeah, and certainly the like instrumenting this method doesn't necessarily it means that you can see the behavior of this method doesn't necessarily mean that if you're not if you're not if you're not seeing the other other like its interactions with other things like the amount of memory that let's say the amount of memory that container has all all those things are there's there's a lot of there are a lot of variables that that enter into working out exactly why something is behaving the way it's behaving. The instrument instrumenting the individual at the code level is one step, and then instrumenting the infrastructure and instrumenting the, the network fabric around it, and and then working out which of those pieces is causing the problem, or which combination of those pieces, even worse, is causing the problem. And the classic one is like this: this error wouldn't appear uh, unless we had we starved this other service of memory, and then the network over here got saturated, and that, therefore this service over here got starved of this, and and that then it stopped working. Like those are non-trivial problems to right. diagnose, and we're definitely not anywhere near an automated. Way of right, yes, sort of spooky action at a distance, and oftentimes you can have all sorts of red herrings as logs say something that oh, this is the problem, but it's not really that. It's something's happening somewhere else. Yeah, yeah, we still don't a lot of still not a lot of structured logs out there, and there's lots of stuff that we like. The industry is still very. Yeah. The good news is there's a lot of opportunity, right? So there's tons of pain. There's just heaps of heaps and heaps, and so it's definitely far from a solved problem, and that means lots of opportunity. Whoever whoever cracks that nut is going to have a good time. Yeah, yeah. I probably got to wrap up here, and so the final question I always like to ask is. Let's say that someone's just starting out in their career. We'll say it's in tech. Maybe they want to be an engineer. They're you know, 22, 23, or whatever the normal age is to do that these days. What advice would you give to them? How would you counsel them on doing it? Yeah, I think probably a couple of things that um, I do talk to a lot of junior engineers who are like, I want to be a front end engineer. And I think that's a good like short term goal is like, I want to learn the skills around being a front end engineer. I wouldn't premise a whole career on being a front end engineer, like having a 10 year plan around being a front end engineer. I think the we often don't know what we don't know about the industry and, and technology and how it works and the things we might be interested in. And we tend to gravitate towards the things that, that appeal to us. I definitely spoke to folks like I really like the whole DevOps SRE thing, it's really cool to be like in the guts of things and other people who are like, I love seeing my, my changes immediately reflected in the world. React is a really cool and other people who have that sort of, I'm interested in distributed systems, I'm interested in systems problems. And yet you, know, you check back with those people and, and 10 years later, they're doing something entirely different than they thought they'd be doing. So don't uh, focus on learning about a whole bunch of things and learning skills and, and being good at learning as a process and also being good at soft skills, understanding how uh, everything from communication and collaboration and documentation and even speaking in groups and being able to pitch ideas right down to thinking about more mechanical things like understanding how an agile process works, understand what a product manager does. I always describe the best product engineers in the world is if the product manager had to disappear for three months and do something, the best product engineers are the ones who could step in and be the product manager without blinking and, and still carry the project to conclusion. And you need to have those sort of understanding of other people's jobs and how it all works and how it fits together in order to do that, particularly if you're interested in any leadership sort of things, both in terms of being a tech lead or a principal engineer or a staff engineer, as well as being engineering leadership sort of functions, having an understanding and appreciation for how product is built is key. Totally. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. It's helped time and time again to have some reading and writing skills as well as product skills. And of course, being as I was in sales for a while, there's nothing quite like that to give you a good shake and connect you with the reality of the world and what you need to be doing as an engineer. So that should just about do it. I kind of got to run, but if people want to uh, find out more about you or if you, you have anything you'd like to plug, what would you like to uh, plug? I have a blog, kartar.net, and that has links to all my books. And I'm also on Twitter as the same thing. Yeah, those are probably the places that I, that I would plug. Yeah. Right on. I will also probably link to your latest book. Is it still the Prometheus book? Yes, it is. As opposed to all of these mysterious other people out there who were enormously productive during the pandemic, it was not to be for me. Did not find it particularly uh, inspiring or creative. I found it downright depressing. So last the last year, yeah, that's the latest yeah, book. Same here. I even took on a project and it was pretty difficult because of all of that going on out there. So I been taking it a little bit easier in 2021, going a little easier. But that just about wraps it up. James Turnbull, everybody. Thanks for coming on. Cool. Thanks so much for having me.